Hello, hello, welcome to Quackle Open. Today we're talking about Dale of Merchants, the complete collection. For a variety of reasons. First off, because it is one of my favorite, and I would say one of the most modular and accessible deck building games that I've ever come across. Second reason, because Dale of Merchants 3, a self-contained six deck version of this game with its own unique mechanics and abilities that you can combine is currently available on Kickstarter. And I just finished doing a second video on Dale of Merchants 3 specifically, diving into the animal traits and the new abilities or opportunities you have when it comes to what that box adds. But in front of me here, I have literally everything. I have Dale of Merchants 1, Dale of Merchants 2, Dale of Merchants the Collection Edition, which comes with its own unique animal decks, its own unique characters, and some other modifiers that we'll touch on in this Right For You, Wrong For You, and of course, my prototype copy of Dale of Merchants 3 that I use to cover the ongoing Kickstarter. Now, if you're joining us for the very first time, I am Quackalope. Thank you for being here. This is our Right For You, Wrong For You series, where we do our best to break down a game into seven categories that we try to consider when deciding if it's going to be added to our gaming library. Those seven categories are the overview, the theme, the accessibility, the gameplay, the modes of play, the innovation, and finally, the price point giving you as much information as we can so that by the end of this video, you'll have a good sense if Dale of Merchants, any one of the four core sets or all of them combined is in fact right for you or wrong for you. Now, this is the first one of these videos that I'm doing without someone sitting next to me for a variety of reasons. First off, because I have moved to a new set location. We are up and filming and designing the space, and second off, we wanted to see if this would work with a single host directing it. Now, don't get worried or flustered. Jan, my co-host, will be coming down next week in order to run the gauntlet with me and film as many videos as possible over the course of a weekend. So, we're, uh, we're excited to do that, and I am so incredibly excited to cover Dale of Merchants and just walk you through all the amazing and interesting mechanics and sort of machinations of this game. Now, a few important notes before we get into that. Some things that I need to make sure you are aware of. First off, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please make sure you do. We put out new videos every single week with the same high quality production and B-roll and style that we are doing in this one. Along with that, we have an active Discord community where we play Tabletop Simulator and other online board games and just talk about the board game industry as a whole. I have a Patreon where we do exclusive kind of behind the scenes content. We're even working on the prototype and the beta test for a, uh, a podcast at the moment. And finally, the last thing that I have to announce is an opportunity for all of you who are fans of Quackalope to get a duck into this game because let's be honest, I think it needs more ducks. Now there is one card in the powers deck here that includes two ducks. So they're in here, but those ducks aren't driven by sort of the Quackalope base. So in the description, in the top comment of this video, there will be a link to a location where you can vote on different animal creatures to introduce during the course of Dale of Merchants 3 Kickstarter campaign. It's a way that he involves and works with the community. And you know, if you'd go there and underneath bird folk or feathered folk, just include the word duck, that would go a long way in terms of getting my favorite creature, you know, a subtle reference to the Quackalope, into one of my, genuinely, one of my favorite games. So it would mean a lot if you take the time to do that. All that being said, I have a tendency to talk on and on and on, so I will do my very best to rein it all in and begin telling you about this game. Where is a better place to start, especially for a lonely Quackalope? then a little bit of flavor text, just a touch of lore to set the scene. The time of progress and creativity is now. The greatest exhibition in the world is again showcasing the latest innovations in technology and arts from all over the world. Over 50 participating nations are looking in awe at the world with their feats in engineering and design. The popular fair is held every five years, this time returning to its roots in Pekins, the capital of Michadan in North America. During the exhibition, the Bureau of Wonders, the organization responsible for the fair, is looking for a resourceful visionary to lead the search and selection of marvels for the next fair. What better way to do so than host a high-stakes trading competition? 
the winner shall be awarded the position of honor, the director of the greatest exhibition in the world. This uniquely unusual opportunity has attracted the attention of many hopefuls far and wide. Numerous eccentric and colorful characters from around the world are gathering in Pekins, in hopes of proving themselves and their abilities. This competition will be one to remember. So that's a bit of flavor text from the Dale of Merchants collection specifically, but that is the stage for what we're playing. In this wider world that we are living in, humans don't really exist. Instead, the animal creatures have developed and started building their own unique societies, in a way representing and reflecting the complexity when it comes to human societies and the diversity that exists around the world this time just emphasized and displayed through a variation of incredible and such unique and eccentric animals. And they've gathered together using the skill sets that they have, the tools that they've been able to develop in order to enter a trading competition. That's the foundation of this game. You're doing your very best to build your market stall. Now a market stall is composed of eight sequences of values. So starting with a card worth one, then two, three, four, all the way up to a value of eight. You do so by building cards from your deck, buying cards from the market, and placing them down or locking them into position. Now, when you lock cards into your stall for display, you can no longer use their abilities, you can no longer use their value to purchase cards from the market to increase your hand. In fact, you can't use them for anything but to drive victory condition. So the balance of this game largely has to deal with how long do you build your deck, utilizing the special abilities and powers of each of these unique characters, versus when do you start driving that end goal, that victory condition, adding cards to your stall so you can hopefully get to that eighth sequence of cards, that eighth value, before your opponent does. The other interesting and blindingly unique thing that Dale of Merchants does is that you are never playing the same game twice. You are mixing a whole variety of these decks into each other, taking the special abilities, the card types, the way they interact with the game, the way they change and formulate the deck that you're playing with, and switching it up with every game you play, unless of course you're playing with the same sequence of animals. So in a two-player game, I would be playing with any three of these animal decks. I also might be playing with any of these 50-something special player cards, player abilities that can be found here in the Collector's Edition. I also might be playing with traps, with special objectives, and other resources like dice that come into play based on the animal characters that you're playing specifically. It really is quite fascinating and remarkable, the amount of mixing and matching and modularity that goes into constructing and designing the type of game that you want to experience. And that's at the core heart of this game. It's a deck building game that allows you to play it the way that you would like. It allows you to structure and experience the game. If you're sitting down with a friend who loves high luck, loves to push their chances, likes a little bit of player interaction, there's decks in here that allow you to experience that. If you're sitting down with someone that wants a perfect information game with almost no luck at all, and they want it to be mechanically deep and sophisticated and hard, so they have to outthink you at every step of the game, there are decks in here that allow you to do that. If you want a lighthearted, kind of silly game that involves players using cards from other players' hands, but not in a mean way, not in a take that way, there are decks in here that allow you to do just that. In fact, there's four primary scales that all of these decks are rated on. Here we have a sequence of every single one of these decks, and each one talks about how these decks work, and goes over a set of four character traits that each deck exhibits and where they fall on that scale. For instance, the Vigorous Emperor Penguins have a medium complexity, have a low interactivity, have no nastiness at all, and have a light amount of randomness. Or for instance, the Scheming Green Magpies, incredibly high complexity, incredibly high interactivity, incredibly high nastiness, and a medium amount of randomness. Or let's do one more sorting through here. We have the Adapting Veiled Chameleons, with a high amount of complexity, a medium amount of interactivity, no nastiness at all, and a low amount of randomness. 
and it says that this one might increase or might be variable based on the other decks that you're mixing into the equation because of the way they interact with sort of the game state as a whole. So every single one of these decks has its own unique trait that it attaches itself to, its own building and structure that forms the way your game experience exists. And along with that, it is an incredibly solid deck building experience. All of these special chained abilities allow you to really construct and cycle your cards, and this deck building game does one thing that if you're familiar with deck building games will stand out as a little bit of a unique trait. Whenever you purchase a card from the marketplace up here, instead of going into your discard pile and getting shuffled back through, allowing you to not really control the strategy that you're dealing with, your card comes back up directly into your hand. So you're able to plan from the get-go. What do you want to do next turn? Do you need a certain value to add something to your stall? Do you need an ability to chain and start manipulating the effects on the table? Is there a card that you're sure your opponent wants that you might want to take before them? Well, that card is coming into your hand. You get to use it immediately next turn. You get to draw back up to your full stockpile and continue with your strategy, kind of moving forward throughout the course of the game. And along with that, there are a lot of cards in here that manipulate or mitigate the luck and randomness that comes through the natural shuffle of a deck building game. The market stall being drawn, your cards being remixed and drawing back up into your hand, there are a lot of opportunities to control for that or to lean into that. And it's one of the things that makes this game so beautiful. So, if that overview sounds interesting to you, if a deck building game that has some really interesting and unique mechanics, has an incredible amount of modularity, and even has a rating system or a scale system for you to gauge how complex, interactive, nasty, and random your deck building game experience is, well then this game might in fact be right for you. From this point on, I wanna go on to the theme, an element that I find incredibly important because it's the way that I consume and interact with games myself. I learn games through the theme, I play them and experience them and visualize the steps we're taking throughout the course and throughout the rules based off of the theme and how that theme and that narrative fits into the core of the game. And I have to say, I really like the world created here with Dale of Merchants. There is a vaster existing society that lives and is expansive and exists beyond this trading game that we're playing. You really do get the sense that you're bringing a variety of new animal types here onto the table. That you're mixing and matching different skill sets and different cultures and experiences. And on top of that, not only is there this fantastic art that reinforces and just allows you to see all of the interesting and dynamic characters, but there is also unique items associated with every tribe that you're moving through. So here with the diligent pale-throated sloths, as you move through, you can see a rucksack that maybe they carry, a broom that's part of their culture, a hat, a basket, and an iron. Just some things they might have from back home, some elements that they would have brought with them, or the snappy scarlet macaws. Here we have a vase that's broken, a drum set, some cookies, a looking glass that they might utilize, a favorite toy. All of these animals, all of these decks, reinforce and reinstate that core idea that there's a world and there's a community that exists beyond this trading game. And then when you get down to the way that all these decks play, everyone feels accurate to the type of characters that are playing them. Let me give you a few more examples, because reading a little bit of flavor text will be the best way for me to show off what I mean by stuff that exists here. Let's go here with the observant snowy owls. Reacting to others. Owls wait patiently for their target to make a move before making their own. They're great at adding more interaction between players and will keep you on your toes. Be sure to stay vigilant when playing with them. So that's the character trait, and then let's pull them over here. The owls there depicted with pamphlets and briefcases kind of observing what's going on. Owls are always gathering and selling information. Maybe that's why they seem slightly paranoid. Here we have ancient knowledge. The Council of Owls helps owl folks around the world make important decisions in life. Quality inspection. Owls believe their culture is the most civilized. Binoculars. 
The enclosed society of owls is based on constant watching and reporting. Privacy is rare. Balancing. Not even the foxes know what the owls are doing. And then extra remarks. Alliances with Arctic bear folk tribes have helped owl, fo owl folk fend off aggressive raven folk raiders. So there's a theme, right? A style, a flavor that exists and a, a culture that exists behind each one of these character types. And I personally just think it boils into a really good game experience. I feel like I'm this diverse mixture of animal creatures coming into this cultural exchange trying to barter and trade and use my skill sets to build up my stall and display everything I've been able to acquire so that I can be voted the greatest trader of them all, the greatest of all the animal kingdom. Now, the other element that is unique when it comes to lore and flavor, not only do all of these cards have a little blip of flavor text down on the bottom, and all of these animals have card types and skill sets that play into that lore, that play into what you would expect the animals to sort of line up as. But also, these hero cards, these player cards, these character abilities that are unique to the collector's edition give you not only a ton of variety when it comes to the way that you can interact with this game. These are 55 new player roles and abilities that honestly change sometimes change the core structure or complexity of an experience with three of these decks. So if you're already done with Dale of Merchants 1 or just getting Dale of Merchants 3 and you're ready to mix it up, you're ready to start doing something new in this world, this pile of cards here will allow you to do just that. The amount of variation you have is absolutely remarkable. But then along with that, these cards have another wall of flavor text displaying that there is an understood culture and background that exists even with them. For instance, Unaba, the greater guinea pig tester. Unaba has been a professional test subject for many years and has amassed a wealth of knowledge of explosives and chemicals during that time. She wants her experience to be applied on a larger scale. So this adorable little guinea pig has been a very successful tester and so she's ready to embark on something a little bit larger. I have Tifrin here, the Fene Fox role model. Fene Foxes are known for being manipulative and enjoying the effect they can have on other folks. Tifrin happens to be fortunate in that she has found a way to get paid to do those things. She has built a career as a motivational speaker that knows the value of humor and entertainment in a speech. Tifrin's clientele consists of all kinds of folks that are in leadership positions, from government leaders to factory supervisors. No matter what feeling one wants to evoke in a crowd, Tifrin is the right fox for the job. All she needs is 15 minutes on stage and a modest compensation. And every one of these unique character cards has a wall of flavor text that I'm not able to go through and fully read here. Now I do know somewhere in here, there are a pair of very handsome ducks not the ducks that we want to add, grant you. Those are going to be Quackalope, uh, Quackalope inspired ducks, but let's see if we can find Yun and Yang, the Mandarin duck couple. Yun and Yang have found each other at a young age and realized they had very similar aspirations in life. They valued justice above all and both chose to become lawyers. They have been together ever since, garnering great fame as defense attorneys known to always defend those they perceive as good. Particularly numerous are those who have been framed by the magpies, and the duck couple has always found a way to prove them innocent. They have joined the trading contest in search of practical experience. If they find any loopholes in the rules, they will report them to the organizers. So there's the, there's the duck brethren that are, exist in this game, but, but that's probably enough on the lore and the theme. It, it just really does fascinate me the amount of depth and character that's given to this world that exists here in this deck building game you know that something truly does exist inside of it and behind it. So if that theme, if adorable animal folk coming together to take part in a trading game, using the skill sets they have and sometimes being a little crooked in the way that they're applying those skills, is a type of theme that you could apply yourself to, one that you might relate to or have fun playing in, well, then this game very well might be right for you. Next, let's talk about the accessibility of Dale of Merchants. 
This game has so much of a scale of modularity that it can be as accessible or complicated as you would like. At the very bottom of the rung, I would say this game can be taught in about five minutes max with someone who knows how to play, and you can get it up and running very simply just by using a few of these cards, determining what animals you want to interact with, and choosing some that don't have a high complexity level. Now, that being said, if you are an experienced gamer or someone who really wants to sink their teeth into a deck building game immediately, do the exact opposite. Learn the base rules and the base structure of the game. It's a very simple concept. You have a deck of cards that you are using to buy resources from the marketplace. Those cards have a certain amount of skills on them or ways that you can use them to manipulate the state of the game. You're playing those cards both to purchase, both for their abilities, and chaining the effects of them throughout your turn. After your turn is over, you go back and forth like that until one of you has collected and paired a sequencing of numbers, one all the way up through eight, using the values on the cards that you were buying to determine those numbers. So it's not overly complex, but some of these decks just mix and match in a way that makes it really incredibly crunchy that makes it so it is a skill-based game where you have to pair your head against your opponent, or design it as a simple luck-based game where you're rolling die and having fun and laughing about the crazy results that you get, or a push-your-luck mean game where you are taking cards from another player's hands, searching for that one card you need while they continue buying and investing in the market deck. There's a lot of opportunity when it comes to the accessibility of this game, and along with that, everything you see in front of me is not needed to get started. In fact, each core comes with six individual decks. So, you could get started with Dale of Merchants 3 or picking up Dale of Merchants 2. You'll have a set of very unique paired together decks, six of them. And so in a three player game, you'd use four of those decks. In a four player game, you'd use five of those decks and you'd mix and match and design the game based around the experience that you wanna have and how many players are playing it with you. So eventually you can get to this stage where it is as complex and quite the process to figure out what you wanna pair or it's as simple as drawing a few decks from the box at random, but you can always start with just one of these core boxes. This will give you everything you need to experience Dale of Merchants and to dip your toes in the water, right? Have a unique game, have a unique small box game, play it for what it is and see if it's something that you wanna expand into the wider collection. So as far as accessibility goes, I'd say this game is aggressively accessible with a scale of complexity that makes it one that will remain on your shelf and continue being a rewarding game to get back to your table for many years to come. That being said, if deck building games just really aren't your style, if you have a hard time mixing and matching and pairing different types of cards together, chaining events and effects and cycling through everything, then maybe this game just won't be right for you. The next element we want to look at when determining if Dale of Merchants is right for you or wrong for you is going to specifically be the elements here in the gameplay. Now, this isn't a how to play. We're not going over the structures of gameplay. In fact, I've already done that to a large degree. Instead, I wanna focus on a few specific elements of this game that really highlight some of the best gameplay parts that exist here, some of the things that make it unique. First off is going to be the way that you interact with your own personal deck, your hand, and the marketplace. The simple act of taking a deck building game and making it so that you bring a card from the marketplace into your hand, instead of placing it in your discard pile and shuffling and continuing the cycle, makes it so you have so much more control over the actions and the steps you want to take on the next turn. And for a game that can be really solid at two players, head-to-head, -head, kind of pathing out your strategy, it reduces that randomness and that luck, allows you to control for it, and makes it so as you're buying from the marketplace, you're able to really be strategic with the decisions you're making determining the choices you want to make or the way that you want to chain your cards down the road. Along that note, one of the best parts about a deck building game is the moments where you're able to use two or three unique abilities and pull them together into a crescendo of an incredible moment or an incredible event. In Dale of Merchants, instead of waiting on the deck to give you that opportunity, you can script it for yourself. 
So it heightens or opens up the opportunity for some of the best moments that exist in a deck building experience to really come through or be highlighted by the gameplay experience here. I already went over this vast array of player cards, but I haven't really touched on the scale and the scope of these cards specifically. They range from green easy cards that provide simple little modifiers like shuffling additional cards or after building a stack you may search your discard pile for a card and place it into your hand, so some asymmetric principles, to some medium cards that have some higher complexity that might introduce things like coins or new dice or manipulate the way that you're using your resources, all the way up to the red cards, which are genuinely cards that I have not personally ventured into yet because the level of skill they need and the way that they just change the core foundation of the game is remarkable. Across these, you can see a wall of text with modifiers and if-thans and situations where their skill set comes directly into play. And in, order, and in order to utilize them, you really need to know the decks and the, the game you're playing and the experience that you're planning on having. But the opportunity is there. And I find this to be modular and, and, and wild enough as it is. It gives me the opportunity to experience any type of deck building game I want. And then you add player powers in on top of that, 55 of them to be exact. And then you add things like trap cards in on top of that, cards that get played into other players' decks that create a little bit of havoc whenever they come back up into circulation or specific cards that are tied to characters that have special abilities, that have objectives that you're trying to complete, that have different types of resources or character-specific cards and traits that only you get to play with in your deck. It is, at its heart, a classic deck-building game. It follows a lot of the same formula and structures that exist in most of those gameplay experiences. But this one takes the idea of special powers and abilities and the way that things can interconnect and combine and, and scales it up to a remarkable level. So when it comes to gameplay, it's one of the elements I wanted to sort of bring in or highlight. Just talk once more about the opportunity you have to expand your experience. If you like it, there's enough here to continue building on. And in fact, it'll take you probably hundreds of games to truly experience all of the different combinations that Dale of Merchants has to offer. So, along gameplay, if you like a game that gives you a little bit more control over the deck building process, allows you to strategize and prepare for specific big moments, and if you're interested in a game that has as much expansion and as much kind of opportunity to explore the world and explore the mechanics of the game structure itself, uh, this is one that takes deck building games to a whole new level. And so it might in fact be right for you. The next element we want to talk about is going to be the modes of play here with Dale of Merchants. Now it is a two to four player game with about a scalable 20 minutes per player when it comes to the game state itself. So in a two player game, you could expect maybe a 30 to 40 minute play experience. And from what I've found, that is about accurate. Some games with experienced players can go a lot quicker. Some games with high complexity, mixing in some of the character decks could go a little bit longer if you're taking your time to think through your actions and really figure out how to knuckle your opponent. As far as the modes of play themselves go, I think I've already gone over the degree of modularity that this game has. I think this is video is where I've used the word and the term modularity probably more than any other video I've ever made. But along with that, I just want to bring up one more time. These cards, these drafting cards provided by the Collector's Edition here, give you the structure and the formula you need to build any type of game experience you want from these 27 unique animal decks you have before you. On top of that, the gameplay experience changes from two players to three players to four players based off of what decks you use and how many people you have interacting with the game. In a two-player game, you may choose a sequence of cards that allows you to be a little bit more head-to-head, -head, doesn't require you to interact with each other's deck as much, isn't maybe mixing in the traps that require them to cycle through, right? But in a three- or four-player game, you might want a little bit more luck. You might want to be rolling some dice. You might want to introduce the magpies, which are going to be stealing from and really manipulating other players' cards. 
These are all opportunities you have. And the game experience across the board holds up at any level, really changing the way that players interact with the game based off of the modes of play and how many people you have sitting at the table. So, if a game that plays two to four very solidly, that allows you to control for the design and structure of the game that you're experiencing and gives you a different experience every time you return to it, one Dale of Merchants may still be right for you. From this point on, we want to talk about innovation in terms of Dale of Merchants. Now, this is always a hard conversation and one that I, I highly invite you to join me on. I'd love to hear from you if there are other games that do some of these elements similar. If there are things that you've seen that maybe reflected in a earlier deck building game or one that maybe has taken and expanded upon these mechanics down the road. This is always a hard thing to judge because our context when it comes to innovation specifically is limited. It's limited by the games we've played. It's limited by the context with which we learned this game when it came into our gaming library. But I'd have to say that I don't know of another deck building game that provides this much opportunity in such a simple package, in something that is so accessible and at the core is a series of fairly simple, straightforward mechanics, making it easy to learn and giving you the opportunity to create a deeper and deeper game experience as you play through it. For me, this spread of cards that I have here is at its heart innovative. And in a lot of ways, I think that this game might be right for more people than it's wrong for. Now, if you don't like deck building games, well then you're out of the running. I mean, it's worth a try, you should experience it, but there is a chance that maybe this type of card play just isn't really for you. But if you like or you're willing to play deck building games at all, maybe you have your personal gripes, this is one where you build the experience that you're playing with. So if you like deck building games or you like card driven games or you like board games in general, but you don't like high player interaction, well, you don't have to have it. If you want a lot of luck, well then you can build a deck specifically for you. If you have friends and family that are willing to play a game but have specific tastes that they don't want, or maybe they're intimidated by highly complex games, well, this game fits both bills, right? That's sort of the point. That's sort of the beauty of it. And in a weird way, like I said, this game very well might be right for more people than it's wrong for. And I think in a way that is also innovative, especially in a game that is so gamer friendly, that leans into such depth and complexity that gives you the opportunity to experience a real brain churner or sit down and have fun with a niece or nephew who just want to have a good time and look at cute cards and build a stack gives you the opportunity to do all of that. And finally, one of the elements that I, I don't know if this is specifically innovative, but it is certainly worth mentioning either here or in the gameplay section that I've already crossed, has to do with the experience of driving endgame. You and your opponent or your opponents play until one of you starts placing cards down into your stall, starting the tick-tock of endgame. You can typically only play one card at a time into your stall, meaning that you have eight turns or eight rounds before you'll be able to even accomplish the task. But if you see an opponent do it, well then you have to follow suit. You need to get something out of your hand. You need to start keeping pace. And so there's an interesting race that happens. There's a push and pull, a pause, a stop and go. Maybe someone plays early, maybe not having all the cards they need to get the whole way up to the number eight, but they're able to lay down two, three, four, and you watch that clock start ticking. Now again, I don't know if driving Endgame through the play experience is directly innovative, but it is certainly novel to this design and to the experience of a deck building game specifically. It allows you to sort of keep pace. It allows you to set the clock. And when you're ready to act, you know the race is gonna start. And so you better be ready to start sequencing and one after another after another scoring those stacks. So if any of those elements seem slightly innovative to you, if they strike a fancy, if you haven't heard of a game that quite does play experience like this before, or if you're in that category that I listed where this game is just one that might be more right for more people than it is wrong for, well then Dale of Merchants may very well be right for you. 
Now, if you've made it to this part of the video, it is time to talk about price, right? The final negotiation when it comes to bringing a game into your collection, the determining factor. We've already determined that this might be something you wanna play, that, that it has some innovative mechanics, that it is a modular deck building game that lets you control the experience that you're playing through. And the price is also incredibly agreeable. These small box versions of the game run right around 22 to $25. They are self-contained. They don't need anything else to play with them. They usually contain about six individual decks, giving you the opportunity to mix and match and control your play experience based off of what is inside one of these small game boxes. And on top of that, they really are tiny, right? This is big enough that you could slide it into a backpack, that you could stick it on a shelf, that it really won't exist or get in your way too much. And then finally, the Dale of Merchants collection, which comes with its own unique cards, its own unique game mechanics, uh, and can be complemented with any of these, also is big enough to fit every single one of the collection inside of it, is going to run you right around $55. Now, again, for the amount of scale and scope and the amount of creative sort of gameplay mechanics that are available inside of this box, for me, that is a incredible deal. If you like this game, if this is one that you get to the table, like I've said before, there are hundreds of plays in here, if you really dive in, that you can experience and versions of this game that you can play before you ever really start tapping out the amount of opportunities you have. Now, in one of these smaller box games, of course, you will cycle through those six decks of cards a little bit quicker. You will get through them at a little bit of a faster pace, but still, even there, if you're playing a two-player game, you're able to mix and match all six of those in any kind of random assortment. And when you're ready to expand, another $22 to $25 will get you a second core, increasing your number up to 12, and then up to 18, and then finally, all the way up to about 27 unique animal decks that are available to you. That's a price point that would justify at least trying it out. And if you're like me, you might slide over to the Kickstarter page and just hit that all in button, meaning that you will have every single deck I have laid out before me. You'll be ready to play with any variation. You will have the set of cards that allow you to scale sort of the modular nature of the game. And you will have this collector's box, which can fit all of your sleeved cards and introduces some advanced components for gamers that want a little bit more of a hefty game experience after they've experienced one of these small box games, or right from the get-go if they're ready to just dive all in. Whatever the case, that's going to be our coverage of Dale of Merchants. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Maybe, possibly, you've learned something along the way. Uh, I certainly hope you have the opportunity to sit down and try this one out. Whether it is at a game night at a friend's, whether you pick up one of these small box copies, or you go out like I did and go ahead and make sure you get the entire collection. This one really, this one really, really is a unique experience. And if you've played it before, leave a comment down below letting me know if I got everything right or if I missed some, some really key points, both positive and negative in the comments down below. I'd love to have that conversation with you. I'd love to have some different perspectives when it comes to why this game might be right for some people and just might not be right for others. I really enjoy the analysis and process that goes into the conversation between what makes some games right for groups and wrong for groups. So I'd love to have that conversation with you. Whatever the case, if you've made it to this point in the video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below. Like I said, we put out new videos every single week and we'd love for you to stay connected with us. Whatever you do though, remember to do the important thing. Get out and play some games. We'll see you next time. Thank you.